Cameroon. Mapping an end game is a theme of a two-day conference coming up next month in Boston, Massachusetts. Two U.S.-based NGOs, the John Joseph Mockley Distinguished Professor of Peace and Reconciliation at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and Pathfinders for Peace, are the organizers of the High State Conference. They are seeking to tackle one of the most pressing but neglected conflicts in Africa, the war between La Republique du Cameroon and Ambazonia. The event is scheduled to take place from October 31st through November 2nd, aims to spark spirited and decisive discussions on the possible pathways to ending the brutal war that has devastated the entire Southern Cameroons for eight years, eight years this month of September. The gathering may not just be another academic exercise or diplomatic meeting. It is a critical intervention at a time when Cameroon is facing significant political uncertainty, particularly with upcoming elections and a potential transition in leadership looming on the horizon. The organizers have opened participation to all Cameroonians, all Cameroonians and Ambazonians, even those still residing in the country, reflecting the inclusive spirit of the event and the deep need for collective input to chart a viable course for peace. According to Susan Gaze, the director of Pathfinders for Peace, who is my guest tonight, the event is designed to serve as a platform to serve as to serve as a platform for substantive dialogue drawing conclusively on the experiences of Cameroonians and Ambazonians for those against the war independence autonomy and federalism all for it the discussions will center around several critical themes, including the upcoming elections in Cameroon, the potential for a peaceful transition of power, and how past peace processes from around the world can offer valuable lessons for Cameroon's future. Participants will also be tasked with developing rules and principles of engagement that can guide future peace negotiations for this conflict in Ambazonia, laying down a clear framework for conflict resolution. The war between La Republique du Cameroon and Ambazonia has claimed thousands of lives, displaced hundreds of thousands and plunge entire municipalities into chaos. Despite various calls for peace and negotiations, the conflict has dragged on and on, with both sides digging in and international mediation efforts failing to gain meaningful traction. The Boston Conference hopes to break this, this deadlock by fostering a, a space where diverse voices can come together and exploit concrete solutions. Crucially, the event will also provide a forum for exploring scenarios surrounding the planned elections and their implications for the, compli for the conflict. Many fear that the elections could either serve as a turning point towards peace or exacerbate tensions depending on how they are handled. The last day to register for this Boston conference is today, September the 6th. Right. I am being joined again, ladies and gentlemen, by Suzanne Gaze, who is the executive director 
of uh, Path, Pathfinders for Peace, who is one of the conveners of this conference. Susan, it's a privilege to have you back again. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Chris. It's great to see you. Thank you. Wonderful. Great to see you again. Let us delve into this uh, subject. I know we've had a discussion on uh, this, uh, I think about a week or so ago. Tell us what is, uh, what is in your mind when you thought about, or what was in your mind when you thought about putting this conference together? Because the Ambazonians have nothing to do with this. It is all put together by your organizations. What did you have in mind putting this together? Well, of course, Pathfinders for Peace has been focused on this conflict since um, the, found, the beginning of our organization. Um, quite honestly, what prompted this conference is we finally got some money to do something like this um, from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. It was a very small amount, not enough to cover all of the expenses, but enough for us to say, okay, we've, we've got a green light, let's, let's do this. And then in terms of determining what we wanted the event to try to accomplish, really, we, you know, I've, we've all been following the uh, peacemaking attempts and, and the various meetings and conferences of, of different actors in this conflict. And a gap seemed to us to be that um, there hadn't really been, been an attempt to kind of do talks about talks or what it, or the process aspects of it that would make all sides feel that this is a legitimate, um, valid peace process. And in addition, there has been a lot of chatter about what might happen regarding the elections, the presidential elections next year, and the impact that it could have on the Amazonian movement and on just any, any sides, any actors, and any events around this conflict. So those seem like opportunities to us. Um, I do want to clarify a couple of things, if I may. Um, sure. it, Chris, you did an excellent overview of, of the, the conference plans, except for one small but significant detail. Sure. You said it's open to participation to all Amazonians and Cameroonians. It's open to applications from all. We, we want this to be a relatively intimate dialogue. It's not a classic conference with panel discussions and speakers. It's more of a dialogue, more of a discussion. Okay. And so, and, and plus for reasons of space and, and funding, we have to uh, limit the number of participants. So it's, it's open to applications from all, uh, all from Cameroon and from Amazonia. Now, that is interesting when you define it as a uh, uh, dialogue. Who is dialoguing between who when you have Cameroonians and Ambazonians in the same room? What do you expect from both of them? That's it. <laughs> We're actually intentionally selecting that for a, a range of views, all the way from those who support an independent Ambazonia uh, through to those who support essentially the, the, the track that the, that the government is on from resulting from the national dialogue. So, um, you know, the existing decentralization uh, and special status. And then we're trying to get also gradations in between. So people who support federalism, uh, we're getting some applicants who say, you know, I support a peaceful resolution, you know, not choosing one of the standard positions. Yeah, uh, it, it, that is interesting because, uh, a, a, again, I see from your registration form you have, you want people to choose where they belong, whether they are federalists, they are for special status, they are for independence, uh, status quo, and uh, so it is like, I mean, somebody would say this sounds like calling for a referendum and allowing citizens of Cameroon to also participate in a referendum, whereas it's a situation where only Ambazonians should be having a say. Well, it's not a referendum. Uh, we're not no, course, in any way referendum. presuming <laughs> to, to uh, no, no decisions. No decisions will come out of this application process, other than for us to look and see what is the range of views 
current opinions, people's opinions may change, of course, with time. But what are people's current opinions so that we may get the whole spectrum of views represented in the room? And informally represented, by the way. There are no formal delegations. This is not, there will be no government delegation, no formal Ambazonia delegation, just people who hold a variety of views. Well, but you, you have invited everybody, whether it be it citizens of, citizens of La Republic to Cameroon or citizens of Ambazonia, isn't it? Yes. So somebody yes. would say, why do you have to involve citizens of La Republic du Cameroon? This should be an Ambazonian affair. You want to sam sample Ambazonian opinions, whether they are federalists, whether they are some accept special status, or whether they are independentists. So if this conflict is ever to be resolved, at some point in time, those who support an independent Ambazonia will have to sit down with representatives of the government, of, Camer of LRC, as you call it, La, La République du Cameroon. Correct, yes. Or, yes. And so what we're hoping is that if anything comes out of this meeting, this dialogue, if, if there are any points of agreement and if participants feel comfortable bringing that forward, that they might promote whatever is agreed to more formal leaders, um, including hopefully leaders of the government of Cameroon. It's, it, this is in the tradition of track two diplomacy. You see, where we're not, it, it, it's not formal diplomacy. It is not an official negotiation. It's, a, it's an informal dialogue, but with the hope that what comes out of it might be promoted to formal decision makers and to inspire, in this case, getting to the table for some kind of peace process that all will view as legitimate. Because where I am driving to uh, at here is, it, it, it is difficult to bring uh, Francophones or citizens of La Republic into a meeting with Ambazonians. Of course, you know what they believe. They will never agree mm -hmm. that Ambazonians should go anywhere. But Ambazonians, they are fighting for self-determination, but they are divided as to who is yes. a federalist, who wants independence, and so on and so forth. So yes. uh, one would think that this meeting would have been limited to these various opinion leaders or holders in Ambazonia to sit down and reason what should be the way of approach with all these shit of ideas put together. Instead of involving francophones, whom you know I a no, even when it comes to federalism, autonomy, or independence. I first of all, in terms of putting francophones and uh, people of these range of opinions into a room together, yes, we don't expect it to be easy. Uh, in terms of your prop proposition that instead this should be a meeting just of Ambazonians, because among Ambazonians there are already a range of different opinions and. Yes, I think that would be a valuable thing to do. We are trying to hold ourselves out as uh, a potential third party of dialogue that will help move a peace process forward. And so with our limited resources, we decided to put those resources into bringing all sides of the conflict together as a, again, as something that we hope will inspire and provide some um, ideas and concepts to to help move an actual peace process forward. Did your organization reach out to uh, the Cameroon government uh, for voluntary participation or uh, representation? And if so, we are trying to any we, response. We are trying to do that now. So because we're based in the United States. Um, a lot of the people on our mailing list, probably you know, a big majority of our mailing list are people who support an independent Ambazonia. And also some who are federalists. We have very few um, government or pro-government folks on our email list. So we waited to see what came in um, and we do need to kind of fill in that uh, gap. And so we are now trying to reach out to folks in the government again not to have a formal delegation but if they know people here in the united states who are able to attend and who would more or less represent 
the opinions um, of those in government, I think that would be very useful. So, so yes, we are trying to do that. So if they accept to attend, is there any form, any kind of formal rule uh, they play in the conference? Uh, no, I mean, not any more than anyone else. No, they would be participants like any other. So you hope to come out with uh, some rules uh, that could uh, go towards future negotiations. Uh, yes. How do you hope to move forward, move on after the conference, if you can come out with some of these rules? In, in other words, how do you hope to uh, uh, initiate a situation where they can be applied for negotiations? So would, in other words, would you be taking up some effort towards uh, some negotiations between Ambazona and Cameroon after this conference, or how do you hope that the rules may help in a negotiation situation? What we do will actually be dependent on what the people in the room, um, did, first of all, what they accomplish during the conference. Is anything agreed on or not? You know, and Chris, honestly, if, if nothing happens other than an honest exchange of views in what yes. we hope will be a, a civil atmosphere, I still think that will be a significant accomplishment um, because I'm not aware of any other efforts where people representing the whole range of opinion have gotten together, you know, on this conflict, the whole range of opinion on this conflict have gotten together for dialogue, except in f more formal negotiations or, or attempts at negotiations. So, um, I, first of all, you know, I, I, I just, I just want to clarify that what we accomplish is is really a function of, of what happens in the room and to some extent that's that's unpredictable but we will try to manage it to to at least keep it civil if there are outcomes that would be worthwhile to advance um, ideas to to put out into the world to help get to uh, to the table for a peace process then we will uh, be discussing as part of the meeting I mean, we'll set aside at least the last couple of hours of the conference itself to say, okay, what next? What are the next steps? Uh, how do we move this forward from here? As of now, nothing specific is planned, but we certainly hope it is more than just a talk shop. We, we hope that people will come out and go, well, you know, at least say, gee, I really learned something. Here's some interesting things I learned about, about people who are on the other side of this, of this terrible conflict. Do you see your organizations in the position of initiating some uh, peace talks, the kind of which we had in Swiss, Canada, which failed? Uh, do you see yourselves in the position of reigniting something like that? We would like to be. Um, of course, we're a small NGO, and so whether we could actually host an actual peace negotiation, I, I, I'm, I don't know. I think we could certainly support one and provide yeah, our it's, knowledge it's a, and it's guidance. Facilitate one. I, I, I think if you are in a position to do that, I better, very much believe you can get the funding to do that, isn't it? Well, um, that's always the challenge is getting the funding. But yeah, I mean, if the, par if the parties to the conflict wanted us, and if we could find the funding to do that, absolutely, that, that would be a, a, an amazing opportunity. Now, uh, you talked about uh, the chances, I mean, uh, the elections and the transition coming up in Cameroon, and you kind of see a window of something happening there. What are you anticipating may happen in that election or transition? Great question, and I am not in the business of forecasting and making predictions. Um, I, I, I learned my lesson a couple of years ago when I forecast that, that Putin would not actually invade Ukraine. I thought he was bluffing, so I don't make any more predictions. <laughs> um, but seriously, um, this is part of the discussion, and, and we hope to do some kind of preliminary, like, uh, um, pre-conference discussions, maybe by Zoom events or something, to get a sense of what are the possible scenarios. Uh, there are a lot of variables, of course. Uh, whether the head of state actually does run and stay in the race for this next election, 
uh, what change of power might happen here in the United States and what that might, uh, what the implications might be. Um, is um, how does how do the elections unfold? Are they free and fair? Um, what I mean, there's so many uh, permutations, and I don't even know all of them. Um, I've heard predictions that uh, Frank Bia will be the next leader, and then people in the north will will rebel. I mean, I I don't I don't know. And so we want to elicit from the participants in the conference and from others, hopefully in advance of the conference, to be able to identify what are some different scenarios that are plausible. I don't know which one would be more likely, but what is the range of possible scenarios that are plausible? Well, talking about uh, Frank Beer, Frank Beer uh, is in China. Uh, among the Cameroon uh, delegation representing the country, and uh, that's can, that can speak volumes uh, as to what lies ahead in the, uh, the coming days in Cameroon. Now, if I may ask you, uh, you are inviting people to come in. It is not like there's a formal speaker uh, at this conference, You're just bringing people in to kind of sample uh, opinion. What will be the format of discussion? The format will mostly be, as I said, dialogue. So we will facilitate that dialogue. We're going to have people probably at round tables, so it feels more informal, not not like a, uh, you know, the kind of seating arrangement that you'd see at a, at a formal negotiation. Um, some of it will be in small groups. Um, honestly, we are still, you know, crafting the agenda and after we send out invitations to, to the applicants that, that we think will represent a nice range of views, uh, we're going to give those participants a chance to comment on the agenda and the format. But essentially, we see ourselves as facilitators and we're trying to stimulate a, a civil but honest and open dialogue. Uh, we hope that People will come ready not only to express their views and speak from the heart, but also to open their minds a little bit and, and be willing to listen to others, others with whom they vehemently disagree. So uh, I know you are profiling uh, participants based on their uh, stance on whether federation or independence or autonomy. So if you have, I guess, say, uh, 10 people seated in there and uh, five say, well, I think Ambazonia should go away with some autonomy. And the other five say, well, Ambazonia should go with independence. How do you work with that kind of position, middle the road position? Let me answer that in two ways. First of all, the, the topic that we've set out and again, things may go a different direction, but as we have set out the, the objectives and, and topics, it's not even to try to reach agreement on what's the future of this piece of the world. It's to, reach, tr it's to try to discuss what would a peace process look like? What would be the rules of engagement? What, would the, um, what might be some principles of how uh, these different sides engage in a peace process. So I don't have any expectation that out of a group of 10 people, we're going to bring consensus on what should be the, the ultimate solution to this conflict. At this stage, we're just looking at what's the solution to the differences of opinion on, on how to talk to each other. So you have on the one side, uh, for example, some in the Ambazonia movement really want a strong uh, foreign big name mediator. Some in the government, I think, um, seem to not want any outside intervention at all. Uh, they have their process that came from the national dialogue and, and feel that they can handle this themselves. So those are opposing views just on the process. Mm -hmm. And so if we could manage to start to bridge those kinds of things, um, that would be a massive accomplishment. So no, I don't have any expectation that, that, that we'll even get that far into like what should actually be the future of the, the territory in question here. 
Yeah, because I asked the question because I am really trying to figure out what you want to come out with from that conference uh, to then lead your going forward as to ne the next step you would want to take with the outcome of it. Uh, uh, I would like you to paint that picture of exactly what you would like to see be the outcome and how you then move to the next level out of that conference. First of all, again, Chris, uh, to some extent, it will be dictated by the participants. Okay. And as long as the conversation is, is civil and people are following the agreed upon ground rules, um, if it goes towards you know, that, that question that you posed of what is actually the solution to the conflict as a whole, okay. Um, but what we were picturing was something much less high stress, I think, which is talking about how a peace process would take place. We're not going to dictate what is the answer to that. Um, but uh, in other conflicts, for example, there were talks about, you know, are there any principles that all parties must commit to in order to participate, uh, such as democratic decision-making processes or something like that? Are there ground rules they would want to see in a peace process? Uh, are there, what, what or who would they want, uh, if any, as a third party mediator? Where would the talks need to take place? Um, what would need to be the rules around um, secrecy versus, you know, and confidentiality versus openness and sunshine uh, on the proceedings? There are so many topics like that, that would, I think if people, um, could, also, during this conference or at some future point, reach agreement on those kinds of things, then it begins to build a little bit of trust and it enables um, people to enter into a peace process with more confidence, feeling a little more relaxed, uh, a little more hopeful, and it lays the groundwork for the conversation to later shift into the big substantive topics, such as what is the you know, what is the ultimate solution to the conflict and other really difficult topics. Yeah, I think that answers the specifics that uh, I was uh, looking for. Uh, okay. But talking about that, in a situation where you do not have Ambazonian stakeholders or leaders seated on the table, I know they are invited, everybody is invited to come. I will be there, definitely. Uh, if that is assuming I pass your application <laughs> standard, <laughs> so <laughs> I will be there. Uh, but where the stakeholders are not there, uh, for example, if somebody should say to me, Chris, I'd like you to meet, uh, Cameroon is ready to sit down to meet with you guys, and the venue will be Paris. Uh, we agree. The venue will be pa Paris, you said? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. The venue will be Paris, uh, as agreed in this meeting. I mean, uh, I'm just uh, making a point here. But I will say, hey, I don't want to go to Paris. I'm not sure of my safety, my security. So if you uh, go to Boston and uh, uh, most of the people say, okay, I think that uh, negotiations or mediation should take place in Belgium, should take place in the in Canada should take place in the USA or in London, and then the stakeholders come around and say, well, 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 we do not agree to that. Uh, how can you get them to uh, uh, buy uh, an arrangement where they do not see a problem with things like venue and who is involved without mm -hmm, their mm -hmm. participation in a meeting like right. this? So one general principle that I, as a conflict res resolution practitioner, use is try to get underneath the surface position and under, you know, down to what are the deeper level interests, fears, concerns, needs. So for example, if, if somebody proposed, well, I think this, I think a peace process should take place in Paris and somebody else might say, hell no, you know, that is absolutely unacceptable. 
then I would dig down and say, okay, why Paris? Well, you know, we saw what happened in Nigeria and we feel that we have to get away from the African continent. Okay, so concerned about your safety, about not being arrested, things like that. Okay, that's the concern, your safety. Uh, what about somebody who says, well, actually, it should take place in Africa. Okay, tell me more. Well, African solutions to African problems. We want to show that Africans can solve our problems without, you know, Europeans and, and Westerners intervening. Ah, okay. So what would be a location or a mechanism that would enable African solutions to African problems and would also enable your safety? Put the question out there, see what ideas come up. That's an example of, of how we try to bridge opposing positions. Look at, looking at uh, the present political situation in Cameroon, and you talked about looking up to the election and the transition that is coming up uh, in Cameroon, what would be your advice to Amazonian stakeholders as you look at the current political situation there vis-a-vis -vis this coming transition and elections? Uh, that's a really hard one to answer because I know that um, as Amazonians, you know, many Amazonians do not see themselves as part of Cameroon. And therefore to abstain, to participate in the election would be a betrayal. And so uh, there have been boycotts of past elections. On the other hand, those who do consider themselves part of Cameroon might be very interested in joining forces with an opposition movement that tries to uh, rally a lot of voters to vote for uh, a different party than the one currently in power. So I, I really hesitate to, to give advice because I, I know there are very different opinions about that. I was actually trying to uh, know what is on your mind as concerns the form of state that uh, take place uh, in Cameroon after the elections or the transition. Do you see uh, a new government or a new leader in Cameroon calling for uh, genuine dialogue, genuine negotiation, or you see uh, the possibility of another crisis breaking up uh, within that same country. We have heard uh, stories of uh, uh, the Hausa, the Fulanese in northern Cameroon, mm. uh, yeah. saying this is their moment to take over power. It is their time. So you put this together and you look at a situation in Ambazonia and people are wondering, is it possible that things could further escalate with that transition, especially if uh, Paul Bia or his son or his tribesman still clings on to power uh, yeah. in that country? I think those are both plausible and interesting scenarios to explore. I don't know which is more likely. I, I do know that in other conflicts, when there has been a change in leadership, that is often when, I mean, not always, but, but, but many breakthroughs or, or kind of new sudden movement in peacemaking, um, that often comes after a change in leadership. So for example, um, for many years, the United Kingdom had been adamantly against any negotiation with the Irish Republican Army or its offshoots in, in Northern Ireland, just saying, oh, well, they're terrorists, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Well, after Tony Blair came into power, he, he took a little bit of a different stance. And by the way, there were lots of unofficial track two efforts that preceded that, that helped to alter attitudes a little bit. But it was that change in power that kind of enabled a, a, a sort of dramatic change of strategy. In the Philippines, um, part of what I studied in my doctoral research was um, around the year 2000, there was a president who declared all out war on the, the Moros, the people concentrated in the, the south of the country who wanted independence. Um, and then a new president came in and, and she said, you know, I'm breaking with my predecessor, I am declaring all out peace. 
and she really engaged anew in a peace process. So that's the, uh, is, those are a couple of examples of how a change in leadership can enable a break and an impasse and, and, and getting to the peace table. But um, things can change with existing leaders. Um, there, are prob you know, there are examples of that too. And as you suggested, Chris, things could also get worse. I, I mean, there could be other conflicts that break out over presidential succession in Cameroon that don't directly have anything to do with Ambazonia, but will still impact it ultimately. You paid a visit to Cameroon when this uh, conflict uh, escalated. I don't know whether you are still in touch with the leadership in Yaoundé, and if so, uh, what are you hearing from them as far as resolving the conflict is concerned? You know, it's, it's, it's difficult because people in their official capacities may not always share their deepest, you know, truest feelings. They have to do what they're paid to do, right? They have to right. say what they're paid to say. I still think, um, I, I still detected some openness to peacemaking in my last visit there uh, from some officials. Um, in particular, we spoke to a couple people who were pretty high up in this, what I call the security sector, mm -hmm. so military, gendarme, et cetera, who feel like, you know, there's only so much we can do militarily. Um, so there, I, I think that people are hoping for some kind of political um, engagement or, or peacemaking. But I, I think officially the stance is still... Um, we can manage this ourselves as a kind of, um, I, I'm not quoting anybody, but, but the sense of my sense of kind of the official stance is uh, we have a peace process. It's called the national dialogue. We're implementing it. Uh, we developed, we're develop, you know, continuing with this special status concept. So that's the peace process. I think that's the official stance. But, but again, I, what people really feel in their hearts, I think there's maybe more of a variety. You have surely heard of, uh, of calls for a referendum uh, mm -hmm. for the conflict. I don't know. I'd like to uh, know your opinion of a referendum that uh, brings an end to the conflict. Yes, well, you may remember we did a Zoom event on referendums and peace yeah, processes yeah, right, with, right. Uh, with Professor Katie Collin. Yes. Um, so, potentially very interesting idea. Um, the key thing is that a referendum on its own won't bring about an end to the conflict. So, what more often happens is that there's a peace process, a negotiation, a signed agreement, and in that agreement, it may say, uh, this is what happened in Sudan uh, before South Sudan's independence. The peace agreement may say, you know, we're prepared to um, agree to independence if a, if a referendum shows that a majority of the population want that, and that is what happened in South Sudan. It's, that's still, um, it, I mean, that's one of many possible ways things could go. Um, and, and actually, I believe we still have that recording on our website, linked on our website to hear more of the nuances right. um, from our, our expert friend. Yeah. Yes. Well, listen, uh, please stay put in there. I'm going to open the phone lines. I know many people would like to ask you a few questions before I let you go. So please stay put in okay. there. I'll be right back. Okay, thanks. <laughs> ABS can help you reach your target audience like never before. Advertising on ABS, you'll benefit from our extensive reach and dedicated viewership. 
We offer special advertising packages during primetime slots and popular shows. You'll also be featured on our social media platforms, reaching an even wider audience. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Take your business to the next level. Contact our advertising team at absafricativa at gmail.com. All right, all right. Susan, before I open the phone uh, lines, I understand this conference is uh, taking place for three days, October 31, uh, and then November to uh, November 2nd. That is three yes. good days. That's a lot of time and a lot of expenses for those who are traveling there. They have to yeah. pay hotels, pay transportation, buy food and stuff. Is it possible for you to break down what you hope to do each of these days? Short answer is not, not yet. Uh, we haven't written out the full agenda. Um, the first day we probably will start a little later, so it might be more like two and a half days. Uh, to allow people who are more local to drive in, things like that, uh, find the space. Um, of course, the beginning of any such um, meeting of, of people from opposing sides on anything has to be some introductions, uh, agreement on ground rules, giving people a chance to, to say a little something uh, We don't want long speeches, you know, but at least to express themselves a bit on why they decided to apply, why they want to attend, what they hope to get out of it. Um, and then um, we will start with the topic of scenario planning. Again, hopefully with some preparation work done in advance so we can lay out what, what we think people see as the kind of key scenarios to discuss. Um, and then we'll move on from there. We do uh, want to use short opportunities to introduce lessons or some stories or, or anecdotes from other peace processes, but they're not going to be long lectures or speeches, none of that. The vast majority of the time will be for, uh, for dialogue, some full group and some small group breakouts in different ways. Okay. And then the, groups, the group leaders come back and do presentations or, or what? Anytime there's a small group breakout, um, typically there is then a sort of readout of what the small group came up with, unless it's something that pertains only to that group. So again, we have to still flesh out all of that agenda. But we will be sending it out to the participants, a draft agenda, welcoming their input, their feedback, so that it's really um, a meeting that all the participants feel, yep, this is the meeting I signed up for and this is what... Uh, this is the meeting I want to attend. Right. Uh, you mentioned also about the expenses, and I, I really wish we could pay for everybody's travel. Uh, we just can't. We can barely pay for our own. So um, we are, and, and we've we got good advice from an Amazonian actually, who said, any assistance you give to one person, you have to give to everybody. So if we get some big pot of money donated to us, maybe we could cover hotels. But at this point, everybody's on their own uh, to pay for their own expenses, uh, you know, the travel, the, any flights, um, hotels, and so forth. Um, there is a hotel very near the campus that uh, we can probably arrange a discount for. And so all of those details will be sent out to those selected to attend. So far, looking at your registration, how many have registered? I haven't done a count. We actually are kind of approaching, um, I mean, it hasn't been hundreds. So we, we may not have to do that much choosing be, between um, applicants. But we'll see. More is still pouring in today, so I, I don't know the exact number at this time. In talking about that, I was thinking, is there any chance you can extend uh, the registration uh, time because many people will be watching it from here and knowing it for the first time and even surprised that some uh, uh, Amazonian activists did not know about it. Some are sending messages and asking what it is all about. Is it possible for you to extend the registration time? Well, we certainly won't be making any decisions or sending out any invitations until at least early next week. So if somebody applies over the weekend, uh, we will certainly still consider that. 
And then we have to look and see if we still have gaps. And then we might be, as, as you asked about, uh, reaching out to see if there are any who hold a position close to the, to the government sort of stance on this conflict and, and trying to bring them in. So, so it, inevitably, we will have to you know, probably look at some beyond today. I would say certainly if you apply over the weekend, we can still accept that. I was uh, trying to see if we can get the registration link uh, up on the screen here, but it is very long for us to oh, put it yeah. on the screen. <laughs> yeah, so it's linked if, on our website. Right. If people go to... Uh, not Pathfinders, Pathfinders right? for Peace dot org. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, Pathfinders for Peace dot org. Yeah. Yes, and the four is the number four. Pathfinders for Peace dot org. Right. Click on events, and it's right at the top there. Okay. Now I will say we, we had a little glitch earlier today with uh, um, the university made a mistake and prematurely closed off the application uh, form. I contacted them and they fixed it right away. Okay. But for some reason, some people still are having trouble with it and some people not. So um, if, if they're having any trouble, uh, they can contact us through the website. All right, okay. All right, you have the phone number right there on your screen. You want to call, ask Suzanne a question or make a contribution, please go ahead and uh, do that before I let her go. Uh, make sure before you call, you shut down or turn down the volume of your TV set and focus on your phone. The phone number is uh, right there. Suzanne, do you hope to visit Cameroon anytime soon again? I hope so. Uh, at this point, I, I know I keep sounding this theme, but funding 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 um early on in our formation as an ngo we had a grant from the open society initiative for west africa yeah. and that funded um, my trips to cameroon and uh, we, that money is now gone that organization now does not exist as such it was absorbed into open society africa um and I don't know if it's because of the pandemic that happened in between or if it's because of these other conflicts that have broken out we're having a very hard time getting funds. So we are basically running on individual donations at this point. So I would welcome donations from any of your listeners. Mm -hmm. um, there's a easy way to do that through the website. Um, so we just need, we just need more funding. And then I would be delighted. I am eager to go again and hopefully to get to you know, Buya, Bamenda, some of these areas, um, as you call them, ground zero, yeah. um, and not just staying in Yaoundé. You have been speaking to different Amazonian stakeholders, leaders, and uh, trying to sample their opinion on the way uh, forward. And uh, as many times as leaders, people like you have spoken to Ambazonian leaders, they're always talking about the need for unity, for collaboration. Uh, are you getting any message to the effect that the people you talk to, they are ready and willing to come together, start talking and working as a team? The short answer is yes. Um, I think it, it, Amazonians recognize the need to come together and work as a team. And my understanding is that in the Canadian initiative, mm -hmm. the, there was an Amazonia delegation that, that worked pretty well. So, um, so yes, I, I hear a lot of acknowledgement of we have to unified we have to work together but then it's when you get down to the specifics of well i'm i'm the legitimate leader and that other person is not a legitimate leader and, and all of that sort of thing i think a lot of this could be i don't know if solved is the right word but managed through having an election you know in the northern ireland peace process they did elections to the peace negotiations um, now that's in a country that has a well-respected you know, election system in place right. that was widely acknowledged to be free and fair. Um, and 
so I, I don't know that it's, it's so easy, and especially with so many people being overseas. Um, but you know, there are online tools that can um, help run an election. There are uh, organizations such as the American, Arbit American Arbitration Association that help um, groups like unions run elections. So, I mean, the fact that different leaders are criticizing each other, I mean, look at the United States. We have that all the time. It's part of the democratic process. Um, and so there just needs to be a good way to, for the constituents, the people these leaders claim to represent, to express their choice of who they see as, as the best leaders. Right. Well, Susan, uh, it was a pleasure having you back again. I hope that uh, Ambazonians listening to you will log on to your website, pathfindersforpeace.org, to uh, support your initiative by making a generous uh, donation. Again, the website is pathfindersforpeace.org, and you click on the donation button. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to... Uh, being there in Massachusetts with you uh, next month. Thank you so much, Chris. It's great All to be with right. you. You have a great night. You too.